You're frigid and demanding. I shudder at your call. Whenever you come near me, my flesh begins to crawl. But sometimes there are moments I'm not rebelled at all. Maybe you're not the worst thing ever. You're utterly disgusting. I loathe your manly stink. I see her mouth start moving. Oh God, I need a drink. And then from out of nowhere, I look at you and think, maybe you're not the worst thing ever. You're worse than crabs. Worse than scurvy. You're worse than lice or plague. The truth be told, you're growing on me just like mold. There's something scary behind your cold dead eyes, and though I'll never like you, it's, it's nice, nice to realize maybe I shouldn't quite say never. Maybe you're not the worst thing ever. I just want to start off, though. I am not fucked up. I know what love is. Love is what I feel when I open a new tub of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. No, love is when you are spanked by your prospective boyfriend. <laughs> okay. But, but you might not know he's your prospective boyfriend. You might not even be considering him as a love interest at the point in which he spanks you. But that's love. I thought love... According to Judith Christine. I thought love was when a nobleman buys you from your father and orders you back from Europe. That is also love. There are many different kinds of love, and <clears throat> that is another form of love. Okay, well, sure, why not? I mean, what the hell do I know? I don't have a 4.19 rating from Goodreads. Oh, wait. <laughs> you need to tell me what? what? You wouldn't be flattered? If someone bought you and then also hid that fact for a long period of time, pretended to be somebody else, tried to horribly woo you, even though that's not really wooing in your opinion, you're going to tell me you're not flattered. No, because I don't know what love is, obviously, from Twitter. <laughs> if you feel confused, everyone, it's because... Rita and I have been trying to read Whitney, My Love. I've, I finished it. Rita has an excellent sense of self-preservation. That's why she's still welcomed at her parents' house, and I'm not, because I've started assaulting my parents' visitors, reading them passages of Whitney, My Love, without any context, just going, look at this, look at this. And then I start reading, and then I'm just like, Tell me. Tell me what that is. But love like that doesn't need context. Words <laughs> written like that, situations like that in this novel should be universal. And so you don't need to be given any sort of context. You don't need to know what happened before or what even will happen after. You just need to know it's a love story. And it's love. I'm just that fucked up. Yeah, evidently, if you can't recognize that that's true love, and then maybe, you know, your parents' visitors, if they can't recognize that those words evoke the real kind of romance that everyone pursues, and there might be something wrong with them. But please join the conversation. Uh, we are the Underbelly Podcast. You can email us at underbelly at gmail. Uh, find our podcast on SoundCloud, YouTube, Twitter, uh, we are going to talk about our poll of Whitney, my love on Twitter, but um, please tell us, do you like Judith McNaught? Maybe, maybe we're wrong. Maybe we're, we shouldn't be sarcastic that we don't know what love is because this has an amazing Goodreads, Amazon and Barnes and Nobles review. And these exactly. Yes, it, it, it's amazing. And, um, 
it's very polarizing. I, I really don't think people have a neutral feeling about it. It seems that you either love it or you hate it. I don't know, Rita. But maybe, maybe we'll find that magical person who is ambivalent to it. I also think that part of it is because it's written in such a different time. And then so people today are able to read it and say, oh, well, you know, it has its good points for being a book, you know, written in a different time. Also, I think that people recognize the fact that Judith McNaught is a wonderful writer. She and is. I think there, 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 there's that difficulty between separating good writing versus good storytelling. Oh, see, this is why I love doing this podcast with you. You are like goals. That is, that is very true. I mean, as horrible as the story is, a part of my head was like, she does write it well. It's just so horrifying what she's writing about. Yeah, and, you know, just for the record, I mean, we've been talking about Whitney My Loves for a long time, and you had read it a while ago, and I had never read it before. And I'd been putting it off, and, you know, every once in a while you would joke about it. And so I made you endure a couple of difficult Laura Kinsale novels, and finally I was like, you know what, I am in the zone right now. I'm going <laughs> to buy this. I'm going to read it. We'll talk about it. And you were like, are you sure you want to do that? And I said, yeah, totally. Let's get in this. I, it's kind of like a bucket list. <laughs> I my love. And I thought that it was going to be horrible. Like I thought that I was going to have to really force myself to read it. The fact of the matter is that I bought it. And as soon as I started reading it, I was like, this is really good. It's really good. It it draws you in. Her writing is really engaging. The only reason why I eventually stopped reading it is because I knew where the plot would end up, and I just really was not in the headspace to get depressed. Because she ends up with Clayton. I'm telling you, this book should have ended with her and Nikki. You know what? It, and she ends up with Clayton, but it's also the way that she ends up with Clayton and all the shit that comes in between it and all that angst. And I was like, I really can't handle that angst. She seems to suffer from the thing that a lot of authors suffer from where it's like, let me make the novel as long as possible. And because they make it so long, mm. They have to, you know, enter in all this intrigue and all of this drama and conflict after conflict, whereas you lose sight of that major conflict. There should be one, I mean, in my opinion, one real big conflict. Oh, no, there's a whole bunch of different misunderstandings when Clayton loses his damn mind. Right, and that's the problem. And for me, I was like, if, you know, maybe one day I'll pick it up again and I'll scan the rest. But for me, I was like, I just can't. I can't go on through dealing with this right now. Do you think it makes it worse that her handwriting is that, uh, her handwriting, her writing is that good? Because the story is a bit horrific. Yes and no. It's like, I wonder how this story would have fared if it ha- if it landed in the hands of someone who maybe wasn't as good of a writer but could tell a story. I mean, those two things are very separate. That's something I've been talking about a lot lately with a bunch of different people is like story versus writing skills because sometimes even when I write, I think that I struggle telling a story. Like, like I don't, I don't know if I have it. Co- she has a story there, but, um, her story is batshit crazy. That's the problem. She can't, she can't, she doesn't seem to have been able to self edit and she ev- evidently didn't have a chance to send it to people who could be like, Judith, <laughs> this is a little off, off the chain. She really could have, I think it would have been much better if she had skimmed it down. There was an in, and then of course, you know, it goes back to novels of the time and all those complexities and things that, you know, maybe authors didn't realize they shouldn't have included it then. But there is, like, at the core, an interesting story there, potentially, about this guy who is enamored with Whitney Mm -hmm. because of her charming personality. And And her boobs. 
and her boobs <laughs> when she stared at frequently, which was just so, I just thought about it and I was like, if I was Whitney, I'd be like, you're so exhausting. That's just so boring, right? I mean, that's a I think that that's boring. And he does it, right? So let me just say, he sees Whitney a handful of times in the beginning and then after that it continues too. But in the beginning, even like before they even really have established a connection, he's staring at her cleavage in a dramatic way and she knows it and he knows that she knows it and he smiles at her and he thinks that it's so attractive and I'm like why is that attractive to me I would be like seriously bro that is the most boring way to come on to a person in my opinion and he's supposed to be this worldly like debonair guy. yeah I'm Westmoreland, Clayton Westmoreland. Clayton, Clayton Westmoreland. And it's like, that's the best way that you could come on to a person. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciating your bosom and therefore you should be attracted to me because of it. And it's kind of like, why? You know, it's kind of like, so anyway, yeah, I think. Oh, should we introduce it before we keep on going on? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so our our book, our book is actually a very famous, infamous, well known. Uh, help me, Rita. It it is it is a well known romance novel, right? Whitney, my love. Oh, yeah. it's a classic. By Judith McNaught, written in 1985. Um, I uh, should I read the Go- Goodread synopsis? Yeah. All right. Fresh from her triumph in Paris society, Whitney Stone returns to England determined to win the heart of her childhood love. However, in order to save himself from financial ruin, her father has come to an arrangement with the arrogant Duke of Claymore, and Whitney is the price. Dun, dun, dun. I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> and um who who wants to do the naming trivia? Who who wants to who wants to do I'll it? I'll give that to you. I'll give that to you. I know you derive such pleasure from it. Go ahead, it's crazy. Um. Whitney, who is the titular Whitney My Love, and Clayton, who is the Duke of Claymore. Is named. Uh, they're both named after Judith McNaught's children. So, question: Why are there so many why, clays? Right. Why you know that this bothered me? Clayton Westmoreland, uh, right? Westmoreland of uh, of Claymore, right? So there's a lot of moors and there's a lot of clays. <laughs> I I actually had to read your text twice because with the time difference, I was like, I don't understand what you're talking about. And also, Judith McNaught even writes it into the novel that Whitney is an unusual name of the time. And she's like, like two characters are discussing the fact that she's named Whitney and they're like, yeah, you know, yes, it may be an unusual name or whatever, whatever. And it's just kind of really interesting to me. This these are her kids' names. These are her children. And she's about to write a very explicit romance novel about these two characters that she gives, you know, her children's names. Yes, Clayton sexually assaults Whitney. <laughs> Why is your son sexually assaulting your daughter? It's just kind of like you really couldn't have come up with other names. Like, I'm pretty sure you could have. First of all, Whitney... Whitney is an okay name. Clayton? Clayton. Hi, this is my son, Clayton. I want to know what Clayton McNaught is doing these days, by the way. I just want to know what he's up to because I would be traumatized. You know, it's like Christopher Robin being irritated, the, uh, the son of the author of the Winnie the Pooh books, being irritated that his dad named... His character, Christopher Robin. I wonder if Clayton, like every time, you know, Judith McNaught had to tell her son, Clayton, take out the garbage. Whatever, mom, you made me sexually assault my sister in your book. 
I don't know. But then I would be a shitty kid. <laughs> no, I mean, I feel like it's pretty good fodder to be like, you know, what the hell, ma? I mean, I really, it's really disturbing. I mean, they probably never bring it up. If I was a kid, I feel like I probably actually would never bring it up because I would not want to acknowledge the fact that my mom named her protagonist after me and her protect. Like both of them are so faulty. They're such flawed characters, and they just do really weird shit together. And I, just- <laughs> I I have to say though, I have I really have to say I liked Whitney in the beginning of yeah. the book a lot more than I liked who she became. Later on, yeah. though, later on, didn't like her as much anymore. How about you? I thought, yeah, I agree. She was very funny and uninhibited. Un, un, oh my god, I can't. Speak. Uninhibited. Thank you. And she was just—I don't know, like she was funny, and like I actually, had, I actually smiled anyway a couple of times. Because of the, you know, lines that McNaught would give her in the beginning or the situations that she would give her. There's an, a scene where she decides that she doesn't want to see Clayton and she pretends that she's sick and she kind of keeps it up for a couple of days and she sends letters back and forth between, you know, herself and, and Clayton. And he's kind of like, well, you know, I think I should send you a doctor. And she's like, no, I'm fine. And then because she keeps putting off seeing him, he sends the doctor and there's this whole funny thing between the doctor and Whitney where she's like, no, I'm fine. And he's like, let me see your leg. You're claiming that your leg hurts you. Like, let me see it. And she's like, no, I'm too decent for it. And then he, so the doctor gets this impression of her as this virginal sweet girl. And then because he keeps pressuring her, she starts, it starts to wear down the facade and she starts cursing at him like, you know, a man would in that time. And she's, She's very, uh, she's very admirable in the beginning. Which I thought was such a difference from the uh, female protagonist in Seize the Fire, who I was constantly told was so sweet and charming. And, you know, I, I think that's why I was really disturbed by Whitney, my love, because I, I really did like Whitney. Yeah. She was really likable. And you know what? Another thing is that, like, you know, you could say she was a little spoiled or you could say that she was kind of a terror and probably in that time that she, you know, she was to a certain extent. But she's also very fair. So she's in love with Paul. She's never pretended that she wasn't in love with Paul. Everybody around her knows that she's in love with this guy, right? Violently so at some point. What? Violently so at some point. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, even Clayton is aware of it. She tells Clayton, you know, I'm in love with him. He's fully aware. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's pretty cool that she doesn't ever pretend to not be, you know what I mean? Like, it's never like a a game for her. She's very serious about how she feels. Mm-hmm. And she's very serious about how she feels about Paul. And unfortunately for her, that whole option has been taken away from her because of her father and Clayton's scheming. Okay, so should we should we uh, give the summary and our opinions as we tell it? Sure. Do you want to? Should we? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So um, Whitney, my love, right? Which, as I mentioned before, has a four point nineteen on Goodreads a 4.3 out of 5 on Amazon, and a 4.5 on Barnes & Nobles, all out of 5. So these these books are, uh, these reviews, These this book has been really, really well-loved by people. And we, we are in the minority, Rita. That's okay. Okay, so... Uh, okay, be <laughs> I don't mind being different. <laughs> okay, so Whitney Stone, right, has been mm-hmm. sent to live with her aunt and uncle. Her uncle is an ambassador to France from England because Whitney's dad is just like, my daughter is batshit crazy. She yeah. has absolutely embarrassed her father with her crush on Paul. Whitney's like, what, 14, 15 years old at this time? Mm-hmm. 
And uh, she actually breaks Paul's leg in trying to impress him. Which I thought was hilarious. And that has happened, you know, previously to the book beginning. So the book begins and she's going to do this great stunt, she thinks, like all like Paul and all the other girls and boys that are, you know, acceptable in society are all waiting for her. And they're like, oh, my God, what is she up to now? And she comes out on a horse, standing on the horse. In pants. And I believe she, right. And I believe she's dressed in pants. Mm-hmm. And she's standing on the back, and this is all for Paul to impress him. And, you know, it's funny, and, you know, maybe it's just because we're reading it from an older perspective. Yeah. You know, from a woman perspective than a teenager. As a teen, you would think that that might be something that would win the attentions of your desires, right? But he's an older man at that point. He's older than her. Mm-hmm. And you can kind of see that he's amused by her to a certain extent. He thinks that she's kind of funny and he kind of wants to see what she's going to do. But that's not something that really attracts him. Like he's looking for someone who's more refined, stable, right? Refined. Mm -hmm. And it's just funny to me reading it. I'm like, Oh, Whitney, sweetheart. (laughs) And reading his reaction to it. And he smiles when he sees her come out. Like he thinks that that's funny. Uh, Yeah. But he's also, that's not marriage marriage material for him. It's like, oh, that's interesting, but not like, hot damn, she's won my heart. But Whitney's like, he smiled, he he's falling in love with me. Right. And I think that also speaks to Paul's character as well, which we'll get into. I mean. So Whitney Paul. goes to France and she gets um, Polish, I guess. Polish? She is yeah. the hit um, of Paris, right? And we're told on, you know, every in every paragraph about how beloved she is and how all these men pursue her mm-hmm. and ask her uncle for her hand in marriage and how they all want to marry her and they're all obsessed with her and how she attends all these soirees and all these men are practically hanging on her every word. Yes. And where she meets the, who I think should have been the hero, Nikki Duvall. Yeah. I think he should have been the hero too. But I didn't, I didn't, so this is the thing. Um, Zana on Twitter, Mm -hmm. she mentioned something. She was like, and I, you know, obviously didn't finish the book. (laughs) But she said that something happens like towards, as the book goes on, that you're kind of like, it's okay that Nikki, didn't get her. Is that true in your opinion? Or am I, I might have misunderstood her too, but it was something like it made sense that they weren't together. But for me, when I was reading it, mm-hmm. I thought they should be together. Um, I mean, Nikki has more or less, when he shows up again in the book, he more or less kind of champions Whitney, but you can tell that he doesn't feel that way for her anymore. They're more like brother and sister now in feeling. Oh, so he doesn't love her anymore. He he is fascinated by her. He will always care for her. But you know, he's uh he's nursed his heart with a bunch of other females. He he did not pine for her. See when I when they were together in France, I was like, he's in love with her. She should just stop this nonsense right now. As he chases her around the desk. Yeah, and he was, I mean, he was like, he was her savior. He's the reason why she was so celebrated in France. She was very nervous, and she goes to her first, her, her debutante ball, mm-hmm. and she's, you know, she thinks that she's not going to know anybody there, and she had met him through someone else, you know, his sister. Mm-hmm. And he makes a big show. And he, he was like a scoundrel then. He didn't attend anything. And he makes a big show of attending so that he can pay attention to her. And so, in many ways, she owes her success mm-hmm. to him. Exactly. And um, I think it's really sweet. He fought, But, you know, I think it's in a good way that, like, Nikki moved on. You know, I, I wanted him to be happy and to move on. And when other people start yeah. bad-mouthing her, he defends her. He comes to her rescue because he is a good friend, even though he doesn't – he's not in love with her anymore. Which actually just made me – like him better than Clayton. <laughs> In my opinion. 
Okay, but this is this is when Clayton, the Duke of Claymore, and you're right, you're right. There's there's too many Clays there. Um, I just want to know, like, <laughs> supposed to infer that he was named Clayton because of Claymore, and that's some sort of. Well, then what came first? Like their last name Westmoreland that became Claymore, or I. You know what? Steven, his brother, got a normal name, so I don't understand. Whatever. Whatever. Okay. So, um, Clayton meets Whitney in France, and Whitney doesn't even remember meeting him, right? Mm -hmm. But he's like, yes! My. I think that he is witty. Okay. To a certain extent, I hate saying that. I think she's wittier, but I think he thinks of himself as witty. And to me, like, I kept thinking about, I had this professor in college when we read, um, I was in, like, Southern Woman Literature or something uh-huh. like that. And we had to read um, Gone with the Wind. Okay. And professor was, like, this Southern guy. He's really, really interesting. And he would just come in, like, in our lesson would just, consist of him explaining the book. <laughs> like he would just come and be like, all right, let's talk about this thing now. And he would talk about how Is that your southern accent? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> come on now, let's talk about Scarlet and this thing. So anyway, he <laughs> would talk about how she was almost like animalistic because she was very, she was very cunning and she was much she was much like a hunter with prey around other people and that she kind of thought what she, she knew what she wanted and she would seek it. And kind of when I was reading this, Mm -hmm. I think I even texted you that I was reminded of this out, that it made me even think about Gone with the Wind and how Scarlet is pursuing Ashley, Mm -hmm. but Rhett is really who (laughs) she should be pursuing. And in this, I assume Rhett is supposed to be Clayton (laughs) and Ashley is Paul. So do you see what I'm saying? Like, when I was reading it, I was like, I feel like this is heavily influenced by Gone with the Wind. There was something very, rather than England, because I've read a lot of these romance novels that are Mm -hmm. set in England, and to me, for some reason, maybe it was just my own weirdness, I kept thinking of the South. It would make a lot, uh, You, I think you can change the setting from England to the South, except, you know, Clayton doesn't get to be a duke anymore. Yeah, I, if you but can you like, kind of see what I mean? I yeah. don't know why it felt that way, but to me it felt very much like she was very inspired by that. Anyway. I do I see a lot of Scarlet was, in Whitney. Yeah, and like I kind of kept picturing her in those dresses as opposed to the dresses of that time. Like I just kind of kept seeing Tara, you know? Mm-hmm. So anyway, what I meant by it, that they're kind of alike is that I think that he was someone who – knew what he wanted he was very confident he was pursued by a lot of different people he could see through people and I think Whitney was like that in many ways too and I think that he sees her he I think he sees her two times as himself and she didn't pay him any attention and then the third time he's dressed up at the masquerade ball and that's where he approaches her and the two times that he sees her where she doesn't pay any interest in him is she's surrounded by men and who are confessing their feelings to her Mm -hmm. and I think he sees her as very witty in that time and pursued too and so he sees someone who's like him I think that they're very much alike in some way (laughs) I don't think that she would you know thank anyone or anything like that (laughs) I don't know she does hit horses she does yeah and she I don't think that she would like buy anyone (laughs) or anything like that but anyway I think he thinks when he sees her that she's someone that's worthy of him, if that makes any sense. Well, see, this is the thing that pisses me off, Rita, is that he could have courted her like a normal person in France, right? But he's like, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to have to deal with this. Um, You know, I, I, I would have to, like, cut through all of her suitors. I'm just going to go approach her father and just, you know, Make it yeah. easier on myself because, you know, Rita, what woman could resist this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good point as opposed to just approaching her and making her pay attention to him and being like, hey, 
I'm Clayton Westmoreland of Claymore. <laughs> hey, um, what came first, me or my name? I'm going to come visit you, you know, <laughs> and as opposed to let me go visit her father in England, who is poor at this time, who's, who's overextended himself, mm-hmm. and make him a deal he can't refuse, buy him, buy her from him, and have her return to England. And here, I'm going to woo her, but I'm going to woo her under a different name. I'm not going to tell her who I am just yet, because she has an opinion about... Because she's heard his reputation. Right, right. Because uh, Clayton um, has one... Very, very uh, interesting reputation. Um, do you want to tell us about Clayton's reputation, Rita? I just remember thinking to myself that I've read books about rakes uh-huh. who are better rakes than Clayton, <laughs> who I've been more impressed by. Like, I think at this time when she, so he finally actually physically approaches her at a masquerade ball uh-huh. and he knows who she is, but she can't tell who he is. And she's dressed as Persephone. Which I love because she didn't want to be Venus. Right. And everybody keeps saying she's Venus and she's just kind of like accepting it at this point because nobody's picking up on it. And he's dressed as Hades, I believe. Right? <laughs> yes. Because, because he is so obvious. Right, right. And so he's approaching her, and she has no idea who he is, and they're dancing, and he's staring at her cleavage, and he thinks that it's just so great that he's staring at her cleavage, and she's kind of like, her a jerk. And they have a whole conversation about how she's not impressed by people who have titles and whatever, and it ends with him walking away with his girlfriend at mm-hmm. the time, who's this big, I believe she's like an opera singer or a singer or something like uh-huh. that, and she's, Whitney is with her aunt, and she's like, who is that? And her aunt's like, who? And she's like, the guy that's all in black over there with whatever. And her aunt gets all faint. And she's like, why do you want to know? Because she's concerned now. She knows his reputation. He's sort of supposed to be a huge player. Uh-huh. He is a love him and hate him kind of guy. He Love him and leave him. Not love him and hate him, but probably that too. Um, and he is supposed to have, you know, bought off this opera singer. I don't really know the whole thing. When I was reading it, I was just like, I'm not impressed. Like, I feel like I've read... So many romances. I Yeah, and I've read stories about rakes who have these girlfriends, and it's like... Like, it's just kind of like Clayton reminds me of the guy with the big muscles mm-hmm. who, like, who keep pointing out the big muscles and, like... <laughs> like, like, like and flexing them and the guy who has money who points out that he has money it's like it's so obvious these are the things that you're hey you're supposed to respect me and admire me because of these things and it's just kind of like over the head i'm not impressed no i i I wasn't clayton is supposedly so sophisticated right right rita and i'm like if you're so sophisticated why can't you just court a 20 year old girl like a how normal you, human being how about you stop staring at her tits like, <laughs> let's, let's, let's make a step it was it was so so i had taken notes okay Ooh. and i took no and i got and i got so frustrated that i stopped taking notes <laughs> so i was take oh i have it right here so <laughs> <laughs> i was like Oh, first of all, wait, I'll go back on these other things because they're funny. But one thing I had written was, like, can he seriously stop staring at her tits? Like, they're, in every book that you read like this, mm-hmm. they're going to give some sign that they find you physically attractive, mm-hmm. that they find this character. We're going to we're gonna see that at some point. That's cool. But it was overkill. It was creepy. It was lecherous. It wasn't attractive. It was... I, this is a guy who I'd never want to see again. Well, yeah. That's how I... Exactly. Because when Whitney returns to England, right, and she's like, oh, Dad, we have all of this new money now. You've redone the house. And her dad's, like, introducing her to Clayton, who changed his name from Clayton Westmoreland to Clayton Westland. I'm just... Yeah. Can, can we take a moment to say that Clayton has no imagination? And there's a scene where everybody's talking about 
you know, the real Clayton and his reputation and where could he be? And we heard that he paid off the opera singer and all uh-huh. this stuff. And, and she I'm had like, like a raging fight and everything and was throwing stuff and all this. And but with his reputation, uh-huh. how did nobody recognize him? Nobody has seen him. Nobody knows what he looks like. Well, remember, he only hangs out with other nobles, and Whitney is, you know. Okay, but also his name, that wouldn't, like, how many fucking Claytons were alive during this? (laughs) I don't know. Maybe it's like every Tom, Dick, and Clayton. I want to go back. Okay. Only so that talk briefly about Whitney again, because I forgot to bring this up, and these are some of the notes that I had written. Okay. First of all, within the first couple of pages, I had to Google... Hoyden. 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 Uh-huh. Is, I, I'm assuming that's how you pronounce it. Hoyden. Uh-huh. Which is a boisterous girl because she's described as such. And then I said that I felt bad for her because on page 12 of the novel anyway, mm-hmm. they were talking about how all of the people around her um, have parties that she's never invited to because she's too young. But she's not too young to hang out with them, it would seem. And that she can speak six languages. So it kind of makes sense why he'd pursue her. She's somebody who's different. She's, she's loud. She's not, it's not even just that she's loud. Like she just got like this great personality. She's described as a hoyden. Mm-hmm. Hoyden? Am I yeah. saying it right? I think so. I think I'm saying it. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, she's, she's, bold and she's all of these things but she's also someone who in spite of that success carries with her the appreciation like because it's not somebody who was born into all of this acceptance so she's somebody who's gone through a period of time where she wasn't liked and she wasn't accepted so she probably carries that with her to a subliminal Right. I think it's probably subliminal that she's got that going on, too. So it kind of makes sense. But I had to write that because I just want to point out, again, how likable she was. Well, OK. That he likes her, but like the, the, the tit staring. <laughs> OK, well, too much. I know we're going to talk about this later, but I just want to bring it up now. When you mentioned that, you know, yes, Whitney is very stubborn. Yes, Whitney, it can be selfish and she can be mean. But she's also incredibly fair. When she decides that she doesn't want Paul anymore, right, she Mm -hmm. invites the person that Paul had been courting, who she had always felt was her rival, to apologize and say, like, you know, I messed up your relationship with Paul. I'm not into Paul anymore. What can I do to get you back with him? And, you know, that is... That really made me go like, wow, Whitney, you are a lot better person than I am because I, I would not, I would not do that. I, I, I don't have it in me to do that. I like to right away. I like people who, you know, I like the person who doesn't fit in and she really didn't fit in in the beginning. And then she does fit in over time because she's appreciated for who she is in Mm -hmm. France. She's appreciated for the kind of, the kind of personality that she has and the interest that she has. And she's, her heart is in the right place. Yeah. She pursued Paul because she had a terrible relationship with her father and wasn't appreciated for anything. And Paul, even though he was, she broke his leg <laughs> and he, he seemed to be kind of embarrassed by her attention sometimes, mm-hmm. probably got up with her gave her that male attention at that point in her life that nobody else did. And he was handsome. And and he was handsome. And he, and he, he did appreciate her to a certain extent. And so she goes off to Paris and she still has that ingrained in her. And so when she returns, she's got that focus on him. She's loyal, if nothing else. Yeah. And so I do, I was, I was impressed that she did that with the girl as well you know she apologized to her and tried to make it right and you know she she's a good friend she is a good friend yeah, and well, i think that's why made it so awful that she ends up with clayton who the first time they're introduced as you know clayton westland ew he's gross he looks at me like he has the right to look at to look at my body like he's he's 
I'm dressing her with his eyes and just like focusing. Okay, he focused on her like on her mouth, on her boobs, on on her hips, on her body parts. Like she's not a, a whole person, mm-hmm. and that really bothered me. Like it bothers me in other novels, but if there's you know other things balance it out, I'm I'm fine with it. But that was it, and he also did it a lot to her to throw her off balance and intimidate her. It wasn't always, you know, a thing of like, oh, I'm appreciating your body, baby. It was something to really throw her off. And that's what really bothered me. Well, yeah, like like I said in in my notes, like Whitney even says, you know, he looks at me like he owns me. And it's like, yeah, Whitney, that is exactly how he looks at you. And he thinks he does own you. So were we happy that Whitney got Paul? Were we happy that, you know, when she comes back, she dazzles Paul with like how sophisticated she's become and everything? I I thought that Judith did a good job of subtly hinting why Paul wasn't a good guy. I mean, when it came out, I wasn't surprised, but at the same time, I could, I did appreciate the seeds that Judith McNaught had put, that Paul wasn't all he seemed. Yeah, when I was, so I'm reading it, you know, with different eyes, like I already know where it's going to end up, and I already know, and I think that you had kind of said already that Paul wasn't that great or mm-hmm. something like I, I already knew going into it. Um, <laughs> and so the way I could tell all the subtle things that she would write about him, I was like, he's not. And, you know, she does say there's that older woman who kind of meddles in to try to improve everybody's lives. Mm-hmm. And she wants to help Whitney get Paul as her advice, make sure he's jealous, make him wickedly jealous. And he wants that because he, he craves that competition. Mm-hmm. And that's really what gets him for a while, the competition with Clayton. Not so much that she's come back and she's this person to admire, but because she's got someone like Clayton following her around. And so she's been better off with anyone other than Clayton. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I did okay there there was one time there was one time I actually liked Clayton and that's when Whitney's dad slaps the shit out of her when she's like father father you know Paul's proposed to me and everything and we want your blessing and her dad just like viciously hits her and is like how could you do this and Clayton is all like if you yeah, ever absolutely. hit her again and he's like, if she if she tells you she's poisoned your breakfast, you will smile and you will eat it. Yeah. He defends her there. But at the same time, you know, he he bought her Rita. I you know. Bad. <laughs> I just I just want my need to I stopped reading not long after that whole scene because I was like I mean, I don't even know what to say about it. It's just that he could be, she just didn't make, Judith McNaught did not make a consistent hero. That he could be that. Protective? Protective. Of, yeah. And not realize that the things that he's done are so, are so long. I mean, are so long. <laughs> To buy her out that way and to give her no choice. That's another thing. Like, he didn't pursue her and then give her the option of being like, mm, I don't think we're going to be good together. He made sure that she would have no choice but to say yes. Well, okay. This was another aspect to Clayton's personality that I didn't like is that he would do something horrific to her, right? From like, Banking her to, um, like, raping her. <laughs> raping her, stalking her, and then be, and then she would explain to him, like, okay, how you're behaving right now is not good, dude. And he'd be like, oh, yeah, you're right, Whitney. I shouldn't have done this. 
And then the next time they meet, he is upset that she acts afraid of him. Mm -hmm. And he'd be like, why is this bitch afraid of me? Yeah, there was no thought into, okay, well, I've done this, which should explain why she's acting like that. There was no connection between it. And I don't think that Judith had not ever made it believable enough. Like, I don't think that normal human beings act that way. I think that even sociopaths <laughs> are like, mm. Okay, this is why no. she's afraid of me. Yeah, like, oh, like, okay, how can I beguile her to, to, to feel a different way? Um, as opposed to being like, he was completely clueless. Like, he would, like, do something and he'd be like, oh, sh you know, he'd get furious with her, actually. He'd be like, why aren't you showing me the respect I deserve? <laughs> Not being like, hmm, maybe it's because I was acting like a total dick a few pages ago. Maybe that was why. So, no, he, was, he was very unlikable. So in, um, and I have to thank the wonderful, amazing Zana for this, who linked me to the interview for, with Judith McNaught, and we'll, we'll give a link in the descriptions. She, the Z yeah, Zana is the best. Judith McNaught really honest to God believes that Clayton is a wonderful hero. And when we get to, um, what makes Whitney, my love, a problematic book is, um, Clayton rapes Whitney, right? He like he he rapes her, and um, oh, Judith McNaught because. doesn't see it this way. <laughs> he rapes her. He doesn't think it's rape. Number one, and number two, it's all because he believes that she's been that she's sexually experienced already. So because she's been intimate with other men, that's okay. Yes, but she hasn't. Been. She hasn't been, but he thinks that, you know, there's that big misunderstanding, capital B, capital U, mm -hmm. and he thinks that that's an okay response. Yeah, it's like, be, he, Clayton is by no means a virgin himself, but he thinks that he has given so much goddamn money to Whitney's yeah. father, and that he has graced Whitney with his attention, with his, you know, I'm going to make you my duchess. How dare you slut around? You're going to give me what you've given everyone. Mm -hmm. You whore. Well, it's owed to him, right? That's, at the end of the day, isn't her virginity or her, her sex what he's, what he's purchased? Herself. Right. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, that, and in that time to then, that was the most important thing. And and so, so I think we should point out here that Whitney has been rewritten. Well, not really. There, there's a there's two editions of Whitney, my love. Now, there's right. the original 1985 edition where Clayton more graphically rapes Whitney. Like, there's a scene where he, like, he parts her thighs and she's screaming. Mm -hmm. And then there is the new edition where Whitney feels like she's driven Clayton to this. Like, she goes, oh, my gosh, he he must love me. And he's jealous, and I've driven him to this. And I honestly, Rita, I don't know which is worse. I would say the second. <laughs> I would say the second because the first you can come away with it, and you would hope that someone reading it would be able to be like, okay, this is a different time, and this is really problematic, and she's come out, and she's mentioned it's problematic. But to give that justification in the second one, like, that's the whole problem with rape culture. Mm -hmm. This is okay. I did X, which makes Y okay. Mm -hmm. Or I did X, which explains, you know, why Y is happening. Mm -hmm. And it's like that whole, like, you know, because I'm a woman and because I've done something, it's okay for a guy to have his way with me and to rape me and to take his own pleasure from it and to use me as property. And that's, that's not any better. Like, I think it's great 
for authors who wrote romance novels in a different time period Mm -hmm. where there were different standards and things that were played up that were really problematic that are, you know, more obvious now. I think it's great for authors to go back and try to edit Mm -hmm. that stuff. I think that she either, you know, should have taken out the scene entirely or had her a whole lot, a hell of a lot more willing in it. And I, I think it, it's really, really a problem. And it's a problem, honestly, in a lot of romance novels and even ones that are being written today. Like, he loves me. He's entitled to this. And it explains why he did it. I don't give a shit if it explains why he did it. He shouldn't have done it. It's a problem. And, uh, you know, that's how I feel about it. I don't know. I think the whole thing is a problem. I just, in the interview, and I'll, I'll definitely link it, is the whole thing that, oh, because he kisses Whitney, he deliberately, like, stimulates her body, right? Yeah. And then, he kissed it, that, right? <laughs> no, like, he kisses her, and he, like, caresses her and everything, and he yeah. stimulates her body, and she stops. And she starts to like get into it and um I don't know if I put it in the notes that we shared, but it's in my notes that he actually stops and he's like, Oh, you're enjoying this. Well, I wouldn't want you to enjoy this too much. It's sickening. And that I I'm sorry, that actually upset me. Uh, I mean of course everything but I, I found that part just more icky. Than anything else? There's a problem with a lot of rape victims who have come out and they feel disgusted mm-hmm. or upset because they've had some sort of physiological response to the rape. That's understandable. If you are manipulating or touching or whatever, mm-hmm. what have you, these areas on a person, you're going to get some sort of response. That doesn't mean that the person wants that. And that's what's really upsetting. And that's, I agree with you, it was the upsetting part of that. She, because she's responding that way, it doesn't mean that she wants it. No. It's not a and, problem, and then, it's not permission. But I think it's that he shames her for enjoying it, yeah. you know? And then, of course, Clayton rapes, after he rapes her, he's horrified to by his actions and, you know, tries to apologize. And uh, this is where I both appreciate Judith McNaught's skill, but then I also really, really hated this book, is that she paints Clayton as somebody sympathetic because after he rapes Whitney and Whitney, like, cries herself to exhaustion, Clayton is like... I'm punishing myself by lying down next to the only woman I could ever love and knowing that she should never forgive me for what I've done. And it's like, am I supposed to feel sorry for you now? No. Yeah. But then like, I I can, I can see her skill coming out, you know, trying to make you feel and how he's like, I'm a horrible human being. I love you. Please give me a chance. And I'm like, stop it. Stop it. I am not going to fall for, you know, your literary tricks. Cause he's like a proud man, you know, Rita. And like, she's humbled him. Yeah. But I'm like, Whitney, get out get out <laughs> i'm like i'm like whoopi goldberg in ghost whitney you're in danger girl and i just go ahead i just i, ha- I had written um a tweet when mm-hmm. dana had sent that out and we were all responding back to it and i had was reading it and i was quoting part of it and she said something like, um, you know, Judith McNaught was talking about how all, you know, romance authors of that time and they were writing and whatever. And she said that at that time they all assumed we were writing fantasy. Mm-hmm. And then she points out that she wanted to remove the scene 
And then she also confessed that there was no the problem with removing the scene. Mm-hmm. This is why she didn't remove it. It's because she confessed that there was no willing way, and she used the word willing, mm. way Whitney would end up in Clayton's bed prior to marriage. And oh, I because, like, we've like, never had premarital sex before, right? Right? And if she's not willing, mm-hmm. right? If she's not willing, isn't that rape? Exactly. Isn't that the definition of rape? It's just... It's, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. She And she also says, you know, she feels that it's not rape, right? But then she admits that rape wasn't as understood then as it is now. That's what she said. Mm-hmm. And she's apologetic about it. She says, you know, that that's messed up. Mm-hmm. But then she goes on to say that she and all the other authors at that time assumed that they were writing fantasy. And that's very interesting. She uses that word as well, but it's fantasy. Mm-hmm. And that... She wanted to remove the scene, but she didn't because she couldn't think of any other willing way Whitney would end up in Clayton's bed prior to marriage. So there was no other way other than him aggressively coming on to her and essentially raping her. I mean, that was rape. I'm sorry. And if she's not willing, like I said, if she's not willing, Mm -hmm. isn't that rape? He's he's a monster. And you know what's what's even monstrous? It's after the rape. After the rape, Whitney realizes she loves Clayton. And she right. and Whitney gets upset that Clayton doesn't come after her after after what's happened. Right. Like she misses him, she thinks about his voice, and she's like, Oh, all the time he tried to like woo me from Paul. You know, you know, Rita, every time he oogled her boobs, that was him trying to woo her from Paul. I don't think that's a natural response to rape either. And it really I mean, I guess that it really does play into the idea of fantasy. If she wanted to write fantasy, I guess she really did write fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um because I don't, I don't, I see someone having PTSD from a, from an interaction like that, as opposed to suddenly falling in love with the person who did that to you. He was debasing, he was humiliating, humiliating in that scene, mm-hmm. um, which kind of skipped over, mm-hmm. right? He's, he, he's got this alter ego. She doesn't know who he is yet. Mm-hmm. He's pursuing her or whatever. He gets her away from everybody else. And she gives him a very dangerous horse to ride. Mm-hmm. And she, the, she, she, I think she knows that the horse doesn't like to see the crop. Mm-hmm. And she shows the crop and the horse, or she accidentally hits the horse, whatever it is. I don't give a shit. Yeah. The horse reacts and he's on the horse. And the horse almost kills him. And the horse almost gets injured and all this stuff. And he's furious with her. And in order to punish her, mm-hmm. he, Threatens to spank her, I believe, in the original. He spanks her. Spank her. Mm-hmm. And I just want to know, like, <laughs> I believe they've seen each other, hung out, quotation marks around <laughs> that, you know, hung Spent out. Spent time together. Like tw- two, twice before that, right? Yeah. What gives him the right to punish her? And why wouldn't she just, like, I think it's interesting, too. She doesn't whip around and tell Paul about it. She doesn't tell her dad about it. She's not like, oh, this guy I barely know just spanks me. No, no. See, uh, this is the thing, right? Whitney has such an overwhelming sense of being fair that she felt so bad. She's like, you know, I let my temper get away from me. I almost killed him. I deserve this. I deserve this. Yeah, she thinks she deserved it. If it had happened to me. Whitney's a better Catholic than we are. Still, I would like to think that if <laughs> someone I barely knew spanked me, mm-hmm. I would do something about that. I, 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 uh, she doesn't even tell Paul. I mean, but she, but she, but she thinks that, like you said, that she deserved that. I, and okay, a deeper, a deeper dig into her psyche, right? After Clayton spanks her or, you know, the punishment is over and she starts crying and she says, I'm sorry. And then Clayton scoops her up and rocks her. And she's like thinking in her mind, like, oh, no one's ever held me like this before. And he's like, no more apologizing, little one. It's forgotten. And she's like, 
oh, unlike my father when I apologize, and I'm like, oh, god damn. God damn. First of all, I wanted to throw up every time he said little one. Second of all, it's just so obvious that he is supposed to represent the paternal figure that she never had, that now she can work out all of the issues that she had with him. And I was like, was oh, my God, this is so blatant. It, it's your he is your husband, father. Uh, what did you think about the other big misunderstanding? Because we have three, three big misunderstandings in this book. The church scene. Do, do you did you get up to the church scene? Nope. OK, mm-hmm. so. Is this about the baby? No. No, actually, this is different. So in the church scene, right, um, Whitney confesses everything to her best friend, Emily. I'm putting quotes around best friend, Emily, because I think Emily's a shitty, shitty friend. So she tells Emily everything that happened, right? And instead of being a good friend and being like, yep, Whitney's, you're right. Clayton's fucking crazy. Don't even think about him. Emily's like, don't you understand why he can't approach you, Whitney? You've humiliated him. He's given so much to be with you. Out of all of those bosoms that he has oogled over the years, he has picked your bosoms to marry. He can't approach you without you know, some sign that you're not going to reject him. And so Whitney's like, oh, what can I do? What can I do to bring him back? And so Emily writes a letter, well, sends an invitation to her wedding to Clayton. Clayton comes to the wedding. She, uh, Whitney and Clayton make like sad eyes at each other through the church, right? And then Clayton, like, asks her to dance and whatever. And they're like, okay. But then later in the day, Whitney gets, uh, uh, reads in the mail that Clayton has broken their engagement and uh, told her, like, hey, you don't have to worry. Your dad, I'm not going to, like, ask for the money back. And I've actually uh, given you a dowry so you can marry any man that you want now. And then Whitney's like, oh, my God, you don't want me anymore? I just see this look of disgust on your face, Rita. (laughs) I just, you just look so exhausted now. I'm sorry. It's just, like, it's just sad that she gets... But she starts off as this strong character who knows her worth. I mean, she has a little self-esteem issue when she comes back to England. As we all, as we all have self-esteem issues. Right. And, you know, that's where all of her issues began. So, you know, whatever. But she starts off as this really admirably strong character. Mm Mm-hmm. And now she's... Pathetic? Now she... Yeah, I mean, she's just into making him happy and thinking about what makes him him pleased. That's gross. So at the wedding dinner thing, right, Clayton tries to approach her because he thinks like, okay, so, you know, are we back together or what? And like Whitney starts flirting like crazy with all the guys at the wedding dinner. And Clayton. And I'm because, oh, you know, I gave up, right? Uh-huh. They're married. Not yet. Oh, shit. Okay, go ahead. All right, continue. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jesus. All right, go ahead. So Whitney starts, like, flirting like crazy with everyone, and and Clayton's like, hey, I thought we had a moment at the church. And she's like, oh, really? Was that you I was, like, hanging all over with? Oh, Oh, you know what? I always behave that way during weddings. And Clayton's like, okay, fine, you've made yourself clear, whatever. And then Emily is all, what is wrong with you? And Whitney's like, he gave me this letter here. He says that, you know, he's going to give me a fucking dowry 
so I can marry anyone I want. He even wrote here that, you know, he he thinks that, you know, if I want Paul, let him know he'll help me and he'll clarify everything with Paul. He doesn't want me, Emily. He just probably feels sorry that he took my virtue. And then Emily is like, you know, you have to be honest. You guys have so many misunderstandings. And so Whitney, like, goes to Clayton and basically fights for Clayton to take her back. (sighs) And it's like, I love you. And they get married. But but while she was talking to Emily, right, Mm -hmm. she's like, what if I wrote him a letter and I tell him that I think I'm pregnant? But she never sends the letter. Instead, what she does is she keeps it in her stationary case. Heard about this. Okay. So after Clayton and Whitney are pregnant, uh, Clayton and Whitney are pregnant soon after their wedding, she tra- uh, she tells Clayton, you know, I left something. That powerful, that powerful peer sperm, you know. Yeah. So – She's like, yeah, exactly. She's like, Clayton, I left something in my, um, in my, uh, writing desk, but I'm just, I, I feel so dizzy. Can you get it for me? What she wanted him to find was like a little, like, baby bib and everything. Instead, what he finds is the letter she never sent. And then, of course, in his mind, it's, who have you been fucking besides me? Now, now, mind you, mind you, Rita, if I am to believe Judith McNaught, right, Clayton is on her every night, every morning, mm-hmm. sometimes also during the day, mm-hmm. when the great Elizabeth Kingston, right, uh, did a review for Whitney, my love, and... um I will also put a link to this in the description, but she mentions that Clayton seems like a middle school, not even high school, but a middle school boyfriend who thinks that being jealous equals romance. Yeah. And I got to act like I'm jealous to show her that I love her. (laughs) No, but see, I remember, I remember. (laughs) Does it sound California? Yeah, Yeah, Sure, of course. But, okay. Like, okay. um, I think when I was younger, I probably would, I I know I did. I, I wanted a guy to be really into me, to like, be like, I want to be his entire world. Right? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. But... I, it never occurred to me, like, how psycho a guy would be if I was his entire world. Because Clayton's reaction to things are not to, like, confront Whitney with this letter and be like, what the fuck? Right? I mean, I, I think, okay, thinking that, yeah, of course, Whitney is cheating on me. But I, I think I could forgive him if he would just, like, come down there and be like, what the fuck? What the yeah. fuck is this? Do you know how Clayton I reacts? I think it, like, even when Twilight came out mm-hmm. and I was in high school, <laughs> I, was in high school I probably should have known better. And I was still like, and I knew that it was bad. I knew the, like, I knew it was bad, but at the same time, I was like, that's hot. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's this guy who wants to take care of you and who wants to spend time with you and, you know, isn't just interested in playing video games or spending time with his friends or thinks that spending time with you is a chore, but wants to be with you and thinks that you're interesting. All that stuff Mm -hmm. is very tempting. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) I think that there's something to that. Right. And then also the idea of like, if he suspected though, you would think that in a healthy relationship, that if your partner suspects you of being unfaithful, okay, Maybe they'd spend a couple of days trying to entrap you or <laughs> investigating or whatever, but it's going to come out. It's not going to just be this big understanding, capital B, capital U, where they just do something reckless and, you know, whatever. 
you would hope that they'd come up to you and be like, bitch, what the fuck are you doing? Are you fucking sleeping with this guy? What are you doing, bitch? You know what I mean? Like, I would prefer that than the shit that Clayton gets up to where it's this whole behind the scenes <laughs> devastation, like, you know, burning the earth. Okay, so. <laughs> All right. So, do you. Did you read what Clayton does, like how he behaves? What do you mean? How he behaves horribly. He I know this. That's that much. He take he literally takes all of his stuff, right, and he moves it to the other wing of the house. <laughs> So interesting, though. And keep in mind, what is he in his late thirties? Yeah, like I think thirty six, thirty seven. Come on now. No, 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 no. It's it's even better. Okay, so um, he, unlike the men of his time, actually wears a wedding ring, right? Mm-hmm. So he takes it out, and during that dinner, he, like, starts waving his hand around so Whitney can notice he's not wearing his wedding ring anymore. Oh, my God. <laughs> he's such a child, though. And he then... The he's the equivalent of the guy, like, in my <laughs> age. <laughs> or, or, like, aim, the days of, you know, mm-hmm. the messenger. Way message would be like like stained lyrics <laughs> or like <laughs> dashboard. No, 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 no. Clayton isn't even up to the level of stained. He's like puddle of mud. No, he'd probably write you know away message. She just fucking hates me. Remember that song? I met a girl, thought she was grand. I fell in love, found out firsthand. Went well for a week or two Then it all came unglued In a trip, a trip I can grip Never thought I'd be the one who slipped Then I started to realize Yeah, I was living one big lie She fucking hates me Ross, she fucking hates me. La 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 la. I tried so hard and she tore my feelings like I had none and ripped them away. Trust. And then Whitney's like, Clayton, where are you going? I thought we weren't going out tonight. And he's like, no, I'm out to seek my entertainment. And then he, like, leaves with some whore. Doesn't sleep with her, but just, like, wants the gossip to get to Whitney that he had, like, left with some with some blonde he was seeing before he married Whitney. Oh, my God. And then, like, Whitney goes up to him and is like, Clayton, s- something is bothering you. Can you tell me what's going on? A- and bear in mind, Whitney's, like, about 22 at this time, right? And he's, and he's like, in his late 30s, and he's like, nothing. Nothing he is happening. He considers taking a mistress, right? He actually thinks about hooking back up with the French mistress he had before he started pursuing Whitney. The proper singer? Yeah. And he starts, like, dancing with her in front of Whitney. That's probably the best thing that could happen to Whitney. (laughs) Sure. Go ahead. Why don't you you go to France and then I pick up my relationship? Maybe it was Paul because... As selfish as Paul is, you know what? Never mind. I was gonna say maybe he'd be a good lover. But he was so selfish, Paul. Like he'd probably be a selfish lover. He's all about himself. He would probably want to have like sex in front of mirrors and stuff. I think Paul is like that. Find and out if Nikki has a brother, huh? We never find out if Nikki has a brother. That's true. Anyway, that's true. He would have been better off with Nikki. Uh, yeah. So anyway, 
Whitney leaves, right, because she figures out what's going on, and she tries to talk to him again, but he, like, like threatens to gag her until she gives birth if she ever tries to tell him that she loves him again. Yeah. Because he's like, I don't want to hear it from your lying mouth. Everything was a lie. You married me in a goddamn church knowing what happened, that you didn't mean it. I'm just like, Okay, this sounds like something I would say as a teenager. Yeah. He is just so dramatic, so ridiculous. When I look back on it, it's exhausting. When I look, and when I look back on it, too, it's kind of like, what did he expect <laughs> would happen? From that setup, she is going to know, get to know me as someone who I'm not. Mm -hmm. He knows that she hates him right off the bat. He knows that she's interested in Paul. He lets her hang out with Paul. Mm -hmm. And he even, like, realizes that she might become engaged to him and is like, let her have these moments before our engagement comes out. So. My question is, what did he anticipate would happen from that? Did no, no, no. He I tells he tells his brother Stephen exactly what he expected, right? He said, I wanted her to know me without being awed about my title because half the time he doesn't know if a woman is really into him or is just wanting to be associated with being around him because he's he's that fucking narcissistic. And he's like, I wanted her to f- know that she didn't need the approval of the people in her community, that all she needed was my approval. What? What is it? What, yeah. I, I can't even. Your face. You look like you want to punch something. I'm sorry, everyone. If you could see Rita's face, she just looks like. I think this book, like, broke her. I'm angry that I stopped Mm -hmm. because I really wanted to continue with it. But I was just like, listen, I'm going to Google what happens in the rest because it was wearing me down because I just felt exhausted. Like, and like, there's no, Brittany, there's no romance in the plot. There's no real romance. There's no time where you believe that either one of them is in love with the other. I, I, there's there's no payoff. I can believe everything that happens. I can believe that somebody like Clayton would love somebody like Whitney. Cause I think Whitney is awesome. Not what he turned her into, but who she was originally was awesome. Right. Right. But I don't know how somebody like Whitney could fall in love with somebody like Clayton. But, you know, in the end, in the end, Rita, it's all okay because Clayton goes after Whitney and he, like, kneels at her feet and starts kissing her feet and her pregnant belly and starts apologizing to her and begging for her forgiveness. And she tells him that she's already forgiven him because she understands. And that's how it ends. I just. I think as a writer, mm-hmm. um, and I'm not even thinking as me being a writer because I think I'm a, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't I don't think highly of myself as a writer in that way. But I'm just saying that as a writer for her, right? As a writer for a writer's goal, mm-hmm. you create characters, you create a conflict to challenge those those characters, and then you make them grow in some way, and then you know, have some sort of payoff at the ending if you want to have the ending. Well, think. do you want the rewrite payoff to see maybe if it gets better? Sure. Okay. So, um, after Clayton begs for Whitney's forgiveness and everything, uh, they have their whole reconciliation, and then Whitney is like, I forgive you. And Clayton's like, no, I want you to understand why I behave this way. And he's like, 
I've never, ever loved another person since I fell in love with you. You know, I've, I never knew, I don't know how to handle these feelings. Every other relationship I had, I didn't care if the person left me or if I ended the relationship, but you, you are my love and you could destroy me. And that's why I acted that way. No, that's bullshit. And then, like, later on, Whitney, like, falls down the stairs, and, like, she goes into early, early pregnancy, right? And then Clayton's like, I thought I loved you more, but the thought of losing you was just so awful. And then she has a son and everything, and there's a, there's a tie-in to a, his, uh, to a medieval story that Judith McNaught wrote about the first Duke of Claymore, whose name is Royce. Why are you rolling your eyes? Jesus. And this was the rewrite? Yeah. And then it ends like that. This was in the original edition. No, it actually ends with uh, the original one ended with Clayton on his knees begging for Whitney's love and Whitney telling him, like, I've already forgiven you. So there's something about having the hero beg. Yeah, that is something that is something I have to point out in the um, in the link that Zana gave us. One of the people said, like, Judith McNaught is known for um, the heroes groveling. It's like a joke, like she gives good grovel. I even think it was in the video that we watched of Elizabeth mm-hmm. Kingston mm-hmm. who talks about it. I have a problem with this because okay, just don't act like an asshole I, and you don't have to grovel. It's well, I have a problem with it probably because I like it. Oh, <laughs> I like it, and I know I shouldn't like it. There's something about, and I can't handle cheating. Mm -hmm. stories but there's something about having the male character realize that he's been doing something wrong Mm -hmm. and trying to make up for it well well clayton actually never cheats on whitney he wants her to think that he's doing it and thank god right (laughs) like he he thinks about it but he doesn't do it in other stories where it's happened i've been really infuriated and i have a couple of friends who tell me that i'm a high maintenance reader <laughs> certain rules like i won't read i really hate time travel novels mm-hmm. i really hate novels that take place over over multiple generations I hate that mm-hmm. and i hate cheating and they're always like oh my god rita like you need to branch out you need to read this you need to read that and i'm just like no, like, that's the reason why I put down Outlander. Like, I was like, no, no, this is not my flavor. Um, I love the grovel. I do. Um, I do like a good I grovel, like, but yeah, I don't I buy do. Clayton's grovel. I don't buy Clayton's grovel. I don't think it fits into his character. I think that the things, so if this makes any sense, tell me, but... I think that the things that he's done are things that a decent person should know not to do. (laughs) You mean moving out of his bedroom and letting her find out from the servants? Right. Yeah. (laughs) Like, the things that he does, you know, the whole spanking scene, (laughs) breathe, her being unfaithful, and all that stuff. It's sort of like he's groveling for it's too it's just too little too late. And it's kind of like I don't think he thinks that what he did was wrong. I mean I think if you probed him and you were like, Why are you groveling? Why are you so upset? I don't think he really could articulate why what he did was messed up. And I'm probably really wrong with this because I will admit that I think Clayton is actually the bad guy more than Paul is. But I think that the reason why Clayton groveled is because he, not that he's sorry that he hurt Whitney, but he was upset that he thought he couldn't win her back, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah. 
you know, not like, oh, my God, I'm a horrible human being. I did this to somebody that I supposedly loved. But in the novel, he's like, I can't find her. Where could she go? And he he actually he thinks that Whitney is with somebody else who is like kinder than he is. Wait, say that again? When Whitney's gone, right? Whitney like packs up her stuff and moves out of their house. She actually moves in with Clayton's mom, right? Yeah. And Clayton like hires um investigators to find where Whitney is because he can't figure out where she is. Clayton is having nightmares going like, what if Whitney has given birth? What if she needs me? You know, what if Whitney doesn't love me anymore? And then his biggest nightmare. Nobody needed men back then. For having, <laughs> nobody needs them now for having birth, giving birth. And nobody needed them then, that's for sure. But go ahead. But his biggest nightmare is, what if Whitney finds somebody else who is kinder to her than I am? And she falls in love with him. Which would be anyone. <laughs> Kitler would be kinder to her. I didn't mean that she's got blonde hair. What if she doesn't? She's got, she's got brown hair, which I'm always... This is the other thing. Mm-hmm. I was always interested uh-huh. in the fact, the way that she's described, and then she would be described as having brown hair, and I would be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that's just me, but... I was another thing. I liked That's it. Really connected to Gone with the Wind. Mm-hmm. And I have to tell you that even a couple of pages into the novel, I even wrote, this is reminding me of Scarlett chasing after Ashley. Mm-hmm. Scarlett O'Hara had brunette hair. And green eyes. I don't know how people can think it's romantic. Connection to Gone with the Wind aside, I don't know how people can think it's romantic. Any help? No. <laughs> okay, so why why in our Twitter poll that I took do more people love it than hate it? I would say because of the quality of the writing. The she writing tricked us. Is- bamboozled what? us. She tricked us. She bamboozled us. Yeah, I mean... Like I said to you, I had been warned by you <laughs> about the book. And so I kind of thought that it was going to be this torturous. And like, sometimes romance novels are, they're torturous. And especially mm-hmm. novels as long as that. Like, you're like, oh shit. So like I told you, I just kind of got in it. Mm-hmm. And I loved, I did love her writing. And, you know, I think that for some people... I mean, it, there's so many people who love Fifty Shades of Grey. There's so many people who love Twilight. I mean, all the novels that we've it's real. So mm-hmm. many people have loved the novel real that we make fun of. <laughs> and it, there are people who are very drawn to the idea of this male who are, who is possessive and controlling and seemingly over the moon in love with the female and there's there's something appealing for people for that okay and, i mean it's appealing to me too all right so closing off here talking about stalkerish possessive heroes right let's let's play fuck mary kill clayton real and christian gray so Clayton, Remy from Real, and Christian Gray. Fuck Mary Kill. Oh shit, that's hard. Hey, we did this with Bug Guy, Lizard Guy, and Edward. Alright. Fuck. <laughs> Remy <laughs> from Real. <laughs> Even though he would want yeah. you to like not uh, to go French. <laughs> Mary Christian Gray <laughs> Kill Clayton Okay, for me 
because I actually borrowed the hardback edition of uh, Whitney, My Love, because I wasn't going to buy it from the library. I did think Clayton's house was beautiful, so I would marry him just for the house. He can live on one end of the house, and I'll have the other. (laughs) Fuck Christian Grey, because he seems that he's really good at it. And kill Remy because he has a crappy sound uh, soundtrack. Yeah. If any man gives me a Nora Jones to listen to, I would. It would be a mercy killing. But see, that's why I was using him for <laughs> sex. No, I need to take a shower. But I would. I would anyway. I and he'd be would. so disappointed. He'd start scenting you again. No. I, can't, I can't imagine. Like, Clayton doesn't seem like he has any pros about him. Like, Except know. his house. I think, no, but Christian Grey has a house or apartment or whatever, and he would take care of you. <laughs> No, I'm I'm sorry. I need to leave my tampon inside of me during my period. <laughs> we let's just admit any choice would be awful. These are all terrible men. Okay, so any any last words about Whitney? Um would we recommend it to anyone? I think that it's a book that everybody should probably read if they're interested in romance novels as a baseline. I think that there's a lot of things that people who are romance novel readers or potential romance novelists could learn from it. And The importance of an editor. The importance of an editor, the importance of... Like, if she felt that the only way that she could get Whitney in his bed was by rape, that there was some sort of issue with her storyline. Like, she should have reworked it. Um, I do think that Judith McNaught's writing is beautiful. I do. I do think that she has a skill in that. And I think I wish that she had someone that she would have listened to at that time that could have been like, you can use these talents for something else, but sadly she didn't. So yeah, I would, I would suggest it for people who are really big in the genre who love to read that stuff or someone who wants to write in the genre to learn from the good things that she did and also learn from the mistakes. I have two things. about you? Two things. Number one, I would love Judith McNaught to actually write Twilight because I think Twilight has a lot of potentials as a story. It was just so crappily written. I would love someone of Judith's caliber to, you know, actually have a good story to write. Because I, I, I do think that Stephanie Meyer really did have a good idea. And I could just imagine, like, a great idea with Judith's writing skills. I, could you imagine that, Rita? Yeah, Stephanie Meyer had a great idea but couldn't execute it. Judith McNaught has great writing skills and a terrible storyline. So the two of them coming together would have made a beautiful story. I think I think so. That uh number two, I really think that Whitney has uh, should be read because there's just so many things that are problematic in that story that I think still resonate today, you know, like what is coercive sex? How can someone be saying no, but the quote unquote good guy doesn't read it? Uh, Stalking behavior, consent, abusive relationships, even though he, you know, quote unquote, never hit me. Come on, telling Telling somebody, if you don't stop telling me you love me, I'm going to gag you until you give birth. Tell me that's not something that's from the goddamn hero. It's just, ah, I just, the more 
I think reading Whitney in this climate did not help. The pervasiveness of rape culture and just how it manages to seep into everything and it tries to present itself as normal and, and something that you wouldn't notice. And reading this, you just see that. I mean, like, how Judith McNaught can rationalize that stuff. I mean, mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with her. I mean, I don't want to make her out to seem like. Oh no, is, no, she seems to person. be. She seems to be actually a very lovely person. Uh-huh. From all of the interviews with her, she just seems right. to be genuinely nice and sweet. And I think she's retired from writing now. And I don't want. She she deserves to live in a, her lovely life in Texas. Right. And she's a great writer. It's just the idea of her responses that gives us this impression of what, and she even says it, of what many of the women of her time, because, yeah, their writers are also women, and they're people who are taking in their surroundings and how people are responding to all that stuff. And you see how it's written, and you realize what life was like then, and how in many ways it hasn't changed now and how it can be written now in this novel and people can come away with it and still think it's okay. So I'm, I'm a research whore. Okay. And I've, I did a look in Judith McNaught's catalog. She wrote from the late eighties and she didn't stop writing until 2007. And I'm just imagining somebody Growing up reading Judith McNaught and thinking this kind of behavior from, I I admit, I haven't read her other books, but it seems that she has a formula, you know, the heroes doing horrible things, groveling and all of this. But, like, I could imagine somebody being born in the late 80s, like you and I are, growing up reading these stories and and just assuming that this this is romance, this is proper behavior, you know, this is, oh. of course he would behave like this because his love for me drove him to these. And what's worse, what's worse is looking at Whitney and saying, well, she deserved it. Yeah, well, of course, I, Whitney. I, I can remember, like, maybe not coming up with exact examples of that, but I can remember reading books. And being really irritated by the female Uh protagonist. Like being like, oh my god, she's being so hard on him. Or, you know, she should be nicer to him and things like that. And it's just funny how that stuff becomes ingrained in you. And like I said, you know, I read Twilight in high school. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah, that's how men are supposed to be. Like, just like you were just saying, like, yeah, men are totally supposed to be that way. Men should be acting that way. That's even, even reading it, knowing it was cheesy mm-hmm. and problematic and stuff like that, coming away with that, even in high school and being like, yeah, it's okay though, is a problem. Yeah. Cause I, I could imagine being a young girl and honestly thinking that Clayton was romantic you know like he he is this guy who could have anything that he wanted and and it is those lines are repeated in Whitney when she looks at him and she's like he's beautiful and he's sophisticated you know he's been associated with all of these glamorous women how could I compete he doesn't love me anymore and she thinks her greatest accomplishment oh my god Rita I forgot to tell you this Whitney, Clayton, and Clayton's brother are all hanging around, right? And they're talking about their greatest accomplishments. And Whitney's actually says, straight up, my greatest accomplishment was somehow, some way, I made you love me. Ew. And it's presented as something that's, like, so great and wonderful and, like... That's Clayton's greatest accomplishment? That's Whitney's greatest accomplishment. That's so sad. That makes me really sad. That upsets me. And, like, Clayton is actually touched by this, that he almost cries. Look, of course he'd be touched by it. He's the worst. 
But the, the problem is also that there's other people who read these stories and you, you if you read enough of them that have the same plot line and the same kinds of characters, because during that time, a lot of the characters were written the same, mm-hmm. you become immune to it and you don't realize what's pro- problematic about that. No, no. See, no, I actually think Clayton is a perfect case study because when Whitney goes and tells everyone what Clayton had done to her. Before she fell in love with him, like, he bought me and all these stuff and other things, right? Everyone yeah. else is like, that's impossible. Why would he do that? He could have any woman he wanted. Why would he have to buy you? And I was just like, oh, my God, this is so, this is so timely. We should end it with even cheesy romance stories from the 1980s have something to teach us today. If you've read it, do you like it? Did we completely misunderstand it? Thank you to the wonderful and lovely Rita who finally joined me in this obsession and now she can understand why I hate it. Thank you, Rain. <laughs> For giving you nightmares. <laughs> I, you know, I'm going to say that to somebody I don't like anymore. I hope Clayton finds you. You should just, like, try to, to freak people out, and if they ask you, if you don't like them, and they ask you for a book recommendation, you should be like, you should totally read Booty, my love.